Hey guys, how you guys doing? Uh, thanks. Uh, I think this is episode 12 or 13. I'm not too sure, to be honest, at this point. Um, but today I have Jacob Bannon from uh, Converge. I have grown up listening to this band. Some of the first shows, shows I've ever been to were Converge shows. Uh, so it's pretty cool to have you on today. And uh, again, thank you so much for doing this. Cool, uh, no problem. Thank you for having me. So where are you? Where, you know, these times, you know, where are you living? How are you? How's your, you know, what's your day to day like, you know, currently? Sure. I mean, you know, my day hasn't really, my, my daily activities haven't really changed. Um, you know, I uh, wake up and go to work just like everybody else. Um, that's kind of how I do things. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I run a, run a record label with a variety of people called death wish that I've had for about 20 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, I come here and we're also, you know, a, a record distributor. We do a lot of exclusive stores for a variety of bands and visual artists and things like that. Yeah. So I come in and, um, and work every day pretty much, uh, on a variety of tasks. Let me change chairs real quick. This one's a very squeaky chair. No worries. No worries. Uh, this one's better. Um, but yeah, so I do that. Um, I do that every day uh, when I'm not touring. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I've done since we started. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, where, where are you guys located as far as like, you know, Jeff, Jeff Wish headquarters? Oh, we're in Beverly, now. Yeah, I think we oh, got You're coming back. We're good? Yeah, you're back. Okay. That was strange. <clears throat> so yeah, where, where are you guys located at? Uh, we are in Beverly, Massachusetts, which is about a half hour from uh, Boston. We're on the North Shore of Massachusetts, which is over above Boston. So, like, I'm assuming somewhat secluded for the most part. Mm, I mean, we're coastal, so we're not that secluded. We're between Beverly is a a moderately large city, not moderately large for us. It's it's a small to moderately um, moderate sized city um, between the Merrimack Valley and sort of Cape Ann, Massachusetts. Yeah. So as far as, you know, as far as Converge goes, you know, Converge is, I'm assuming, essentially started in the early 90s. How, how did Converge come to be as far as like you and the rest of them? Like, how, how did Converge become Converge? Um, just like any other group of teenagers playing punk rock and hardcore or being or being interested in in that world, you know, we started playing music and uh, started getting together and just kind of playing covers and writing our own stuff as as kids. And uh, we just kind of continued on that path. Uh, it never really changed, you know. I started trying to play with other people musically uh, when I was about 12 or 13 years old, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's evolved into Converge. Yeah. Um, I think Kurt who is still uh he's he's still doing the band with me we started the band i he, i think he he probably joined in 1991 is my guess he came in because he was you know a competent guitarist and uh you know you, you're working with the people that are within your town at the time yeah so you're just kind of working with you know like-minded people that you can find that's how we found our first drummer he was like you know one of the only two guys that we knew with a drum set the inner town, you know, that liked heavy music. Yeah. Uh, and then we just started kind of growing and playing and that was pretty much it. Um, and it continued to evolve. It continued, continued to, to work and be creative together and to, you know, make our band what it is now. Yeah. I, even, even like till this day, I always, I mean, I'm glad to do an interview because I wanted to always ask, but like even listening to like the early years of, of Converge, like, you know, the carrying and killing era, which is like the first mm -hmm. years of Converge, you know, I, I listen to the songs and I try to pick it apart in the sense of like, what was influencing this music? Because, you know, uh, I kind of reference it to other bands and it, it's really hard. So and my, my question is that at that time, what were you guys listening to that influenced this band? A, a whole lot of everything. You know, we were really fortunate to come up at a specific time in music history where there was a lot of... Um, a lot of really interesting things happening. You know, we had the the golden era of sort of you know thrash and death metal was occurring. Grind was uh, the grind and sort of the underworld, the, the underground world of uh, of metal was really becoming an established thing. You know, I'm talking like between 1990 and 1994, 
Yeah. Um, also at that time you had discord records and you had the, the sort of post revolution summer era bands starting to evolve and get a lot of notoriety. And so we're listening to a lot of bands like Fugazi and uh, right to spring and Lungfish, uh, things like that. You know, the makeup were, were a band that was pretty popular at the time uh, that we paid attention to. We, you had uh, all the New York hardcore bands, were firing on all cylinders, you know, between 19, yeah. you know, whatever, 88 and, you know, 92, 93. And, you know, we were sucking up all that stuff. So we were listening to everything from, you know, Leeway to Cathedral right. to Napalm Death to, uh, you know, like, I don't know, Hoover, um, pretty much anybody and anything that we found to be interesting. And what you heard within our band was us just trying to find our, our own creative voice using all of these sort of uh, all of these influences you know and uh that's kind of what you what you have and I, and I think that's very obvious in the sense that like you know you you listen to those early converge songs or records and I, I yeah you definitely have have pulled from a bunch of influences but i can't sit there and be like yo this is you know this is this or this is a rip off of this because it, it really it really isn't you know and I, no i mean we weren't trying to we've never tried to tried to emulate something fully that another band had, you know, we would hear qualities and things and say, well, that's really exciting. We, you know, we wish we could write something like that. And we would use our rudimentary skills yeah. to, to try to do that in, in some way, yeah. or try to apply it to some of these visions that we had. And as that, that started, you know, when, it, when we first started, it was very like, it was very gruff and very sort of, um, you know, meat and potatoes hardcore because that's kind of the stuff that was around at the time that was relatively easy for us to play. You know, we were em emulating bands like like Sheer Terror and Slapshot and like early Biohazard and stuff because that's the stuff we were seeing. You know, we were we were seeing Life of Agony come through like every other week playing on their first and second demos. Like those are the bands that we were like um, we were just immersed in for a while. And then as our palette grew, you know, sonically we grew as people and, um, you know, and as artists. I mean, you know, you guys are, you know, started in 91, give or take. You guys are coming on 30 years of uh, being a band almost, you know? Um, yeah, something like that. And, uh, you know, when, when someone asked me, or we you know talk about Converge, Converge is almost, made a lane of their own and you know trying to describe a, a genre for converge is almost nearly impossible because I, I don't know how to describe it to, to i can't pinpoint it to one type of uh genre of music you know you guys sure. you guys are in your own lane in my in my opinion um but doing that for 30 years almost 30 years you know and essentially being the same core group of, of band members how have you guys done that for so long su successfully? And, and I ask this because I've been in a band for almost 15 years and sometimes mm -hmm. that seems fucking crazy impossible to me. So doubling that up, I'm, you know, how has that been, How that process, how you guys continue to be successful? Well, as you said in, in your experience, it is, it is a challenge in some ways, but you also have a, um, a sibling like relationship with the people that you play with. So you're closer than typical friends, but it's also different than, uh, than very close family. You know, you have this really unique relationship that, um, is hard to describe to people, you know, um, and you really have to have a lot of respect for one another and what, what one another bring to the table in terms of, you know, creating the sort of, the the overall character of what your what your collective vision is right so like you have to kind of be egoless and you have to kind of know your place and know your strengths and your weaknesses and be a good team player you know and just really uh, on a very simple human level respect the people that you're playing with and uh yeah i mean we all have our quirks we all make fun of each other and yeah. you know we're definitely um not the i guess like it, when we're all together, we're definitely not the most serious people. We probably joke more than any other band when yeah. we're together because our music is is so uh, intensely serious. So uh, we just kind of, I don't know, we just have a good balance of internally of, of what we are. Um, you know, we've had only a couple lineup changes since we've been a band and probably a lot 
fewer than most bands. That was in the early um, uh, For the most part. So Aaron Dahlbeck joined our band in, I think it was 1993. I think it was 1993 or four. And he was in our band for know, about five or six years. And he started being in that time with our, uh, with our drummer at the time. Mm-hmm. And they started doing that. And his focus was, was very much that world of hardcore where we were growing a, um, we were growing a very different way. Yeah. Um, and we just kind of outgrew each other artistically. Uh, so at that point, you know, we chose to shed a guitar player, it made the most sense. That way we could keep friendships intact, you know, to a degree. Obviously, there's always going to be some sort of turbulence with something like that because, you know, it's not a not a feel good subject for anybody. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And then um, around, I think it was, I think it was around 99, um, we started looking for another drummer because it was pretty obvious at that time that we outgrew our original drummer. Um, he just wasn't really as interested in evolving and, you know, being a, a, a musician like we wanted to yeah. as like the, you know, the core of us wanted to. So um, our first guy that we got was John Giorgio. He was in a band called Conifera uh, from uh, Virginia who are a fantastic band. Um, and, and Nate, our bass player knew him from, from being down from Virginia and uh, he did about a six or eight month stint in our band. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did one European tour with him, which was, you know, this is a, the, still the dark ages of, um, of touring. Uh, and he was, um, yeah, he was basically thrown to the wolves in that regard. You know, we, it was before the Euro, you know? So yeah. like, <laughs> you know, and every, every country was not an open border. You know, there were, there were no open borders and, you know, there was, you're juggling eight currencies for, you know, six weeks of your life and doing these, you know, really intense drives yeah. and, uh, you know, playing to nobody. And it was uh, definitely a challenge and it burnt him out. So yeah. he pretty much broke after that. I think he only played uh, maybe one or two shows with us in the States and everything else was in Europe. And then uh, uh, Ben, our, our current drummer and, you know, our only drummer of our definitive lineup, pretty much joined at that time. So he's joined the band around like 99, 2000 mm-hmm. and he's been in the band since. So, you know, our youngest guy in the band has been in for 20 years. So yeah. it's not like it's a, uh, um, it's not like we're shuffling stuff around. And when we, we made the decision at that point when Ben joined the band and uh, when we, you know, went down to just being a singular uh, guitar band that this was, this was converged. This made the most sense. This is our definitive lineup and this is how we're going to run things from here on out. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we won't, um, hold on a second. Sorry. Um, yeah. it doesn't mean, uh, hold on. I have an, I have another interview calling me. So, um, hold on one second. No worries. One of those days. Um, there we go. All right. Um, so at that point, you know, we decided this was going to be our lineup and this is how things were going to roll and uh, we'll collaborate with people and, you know, do projects and do things. But in terms of it being converged, this is converged and this is how we're going to run things. So that's it. It's cool to hear that dynamic you know, for bands that have been a band for so long, just because I, I see that same, uh, I see that same camaraderie between me and my band members. And I think it was mm-hmm. funny about the last time, uh, one of the last, shows we played as a band uh we played with you guys in, in canada right yeah i remember it like you know usually you see a lot of bands like not interacting with the, with each other but like watching you guys you know 20 years later still having that that friendship and that interaction is pretty fucking cool for you know someone that's significantly younger as a band you know um mm-hmm. but uh you know so it's crazy to see that but one of the things that i always loved about bands and one of the things that I've always looked at, you know, when I was younger, I'd open up, I'd open up, you know, the records and, you know, I would always look at the thank you list and that's how I found out about bands. But one sure. of the things is like, I used to love lyrics. I fucking love lyrics. I would read through lyrics and try to understand the bands and understand what they're about. With, with you, I'm assuming you write most of the lyrical content for Converge for the most part. Is that? Yeah, everything. Yeah. So what, what is the constant influence for so long what's been 
you know, the biggest influence in your life to write lyrics. Cause at some points in my life, I'm just like, I can't even fucking write a song anymore. You know? <laughs> well, I think the, the key is, well, not number one, not to force anything. Right. So like, if I'm not having life experiences that are dictating that I need some sort of outlet in my life, that's going to be, be written prose in some way. Um, then I'm not going to put it out there. Like I'm not going to sit there and try to put myself psychologically in a position where I'm, I'm writing that, you know, it just needs to be real. Yeah. You know? So I might go through periods where I'll write every day. I might go through periods where I don't write for two months, three months. Um, so it really, you know, it really, really depends. Um, it's always, that that's always changing in that regard. Um, and I, I'm okay with that, you know, that, constant flux with things i don't um yeah like i don't i don't look at it as like a as a tool that i always have to sharpen you know like i'm, I'm sharpening it when i'm working on it and you know hopefully i'm becoming a better communicator and better artist when i when i take the time to do those things um so that's obviously important not forcing it and having it be legitimate and real um and you know i just write about life you know i, I think life is a sort of uh, limitless well when it comes to um, when it comes to life experiences and you know things that do motivate you to 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 do something you know like our band isn't isn't about um, like a specific theme or like we we don't like pose and and try to like be some sort of character that's not anything other than human yeah. and so when you're writing human lyrics about human experiences it's just kind of is what it is you know. Um, Dude. So I, th I think with bands that, that do things like, you know, write more fantastical ideas of things like, uh, is that, if that's even a word, um, you know, things that are sort of like, you know, rooted in like, you know, Dungeons and Dragons style yeah. shit or so, like whatever. Yeah. I mean, like it is what it is. They probably get bored with their themes, but they have like a basic theme that they can kind of go to. Um, and they could probably write pretty much any, any time about, you know, a, a dragon or something tough or something hard or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, it's not about that for me, you know? Um, so I just, since I don't assign those, since I don't s assign parameters to it and I just kind of keep it as free as possible. Um, I, I hope that that sort of honesty in what I'm, what I'm trying to put out there is conveyed overall, you know, it's, it's, um, I guess it's a, it's a really, um, vulnerable way of writing. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the, the best way. I mean, reading, the, yeah, re reading the lyrics, you know, it's, it's obviously very real. And at, and at moments, it's, uh, it can be very dark. Do you, you know, do, for you personally, is it therapeutic for you? Or is it at times where it's difficult to put these words on paper? Um, well, it's, it's therapeutic in the sense that, you know, it's, it's giving me an, a healthy outlet for complex emotions. So yeah. I'm putting it all within song, within visual art, um, and that's what I do. I, I don't know if it's if it's super healthy to do. I think it probably is. Um, it's better than you know letting it sort of fester inside me or manifest in some sort of unhealthy way. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's just kind of where I where I put it. Um, yeah. I don't really self-analyze past that. You know, I just kind of do it. Makes me feel better. Um, it is a complex subject in the sense that, you know, you when you play songs live, you have to sort of reconnect with some of that material. And yeah. depending on your and depending on your headspace at that given time, it can be a very healthy experience and cathartic, or it can be kind of a dark experience. You know, um, it really depends on where where you are. Uh, in your sort of own emotional sea, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, you know, where you are at that given point in your life. And also there's another, you know, secondary level of things. Actually, I don't want to call it secondary, just an additional level of things, which are a bit complex, which is the relationship people have with your own uh, written material, you know, so once you write a song, I write a song, it goes out into the world and people attach a variety of meanings to it that are personal to them and related to their own lives. Yeah. And that's a very different relationship that they're having with your, um, 
with your your creation that you don't necessarily have control over yeah. and uh that's a whole nother whole nother can of worms there too <laughs> yeah i mean i i definitely admire that vulnerability of like obviously obviously putting your words onto paper and those emotions on the paper because th- there's definitely been songs where like you know i there's songs that i just don't ever want to play just because you know it was a time and place and a, and a time and place i don't want to revisit you know <laughs> but, uh, yeah for sure and like you know and it doesn't necessarily even have to be something as literal as written word you know it could be it can be a riff you wrote at a really dark time and it just kind of rips you back into that spot sometimes you know um it can be and whatever your contribution is um because yeah. like that's the thing it's like when i look at the other three guys and converge like when we're playing we're all playing with the same sort of ferocity right yeah. But it's all coming from different places. You know, I might be the narrator in terms of the the sort of my personal experience and what I'm written and what people are communicating or what it was being like outwardly communicated to people. But, you know, like Kirk could be, you know, like ripping his guitar up for a variety of reasons that, you know, led him to write that riff in the first place and Nate the same thing. And Ben's losing his mind in the back because, you know, that's just how he processes shit in a healthy way too. Yeah. Um so yeah, it's um it's a very complex thing that I think only people that make music really think about the, those relationships. But yeah, I think it's kind of fascinating personally. Yeah, it's cool to see years later, you know, kind of to kind of see your storyline in a in a musical format, you know, because that's kind of essentially what it is. Um, yeah, and in some ways it is, and like I don't know if that's like totally the the greatest thing for for your in in life like personally you know i don't know if it's that's the most healthy thing to be like be able to look back at sort of these little time stamps of your life you know but like the way i do it i just don't look back i just make stuff and move forward there is a little bit of you know retrospection when you have to play stuff live for sure but you know i don't self-analyze really past that part yeah um that's awesome to hear that as far as you know musical Uh, you've also been a visual artist for for so as long as I can remember, you know, when it comes to converge artwork, but also, you know, <clears throat> your your artwork is iconic in the sense that like if I see something of records you've done for other bands, and I was like, oh yeah, that's a that's a band and piece, you know, and it's it's mm-hmm. really cool to see what you've created and developed. How often are you still creating artwork? Like, do you, is that still? A I'm literally doing it as I talk to you right now. I'm editing a painting because I have a, de- I have a deadline. Um, I have a deadline for tomorrow for some album packaging that I'm trying to, trying to hit. That's awesome. Um, and I've been, it's, that's been the, one of the bigger challenges in these COVID times that we've been in is essentially being, being creative and being available for those things. Cause you know, as I mentioned before, you know, I'm, I'm a partner in death wish. And so, you know, I, I founded it, but we have a staff, but we had to lay off a lot of the staff or at least furlough a lot of the staff um, initially when COVID stuff hit. And uh, for a few months uh, there was just like a skeleton crew of us just getting orders out the door, you know, just making sure, you know, everything was, was, uh, was running on that end because that's the, the meat and potatoes of the business, you know, and make sure yeah. that, you know, customers are getting their stuff. I was packing Zubaba orders, you know, uh, you. when that, when the record, you're welcome. Like when the, um, well, thank you. When the, um, yeah, when the new record came out. Um, so like, yeah, like I was doing that and that obviously came uh, before any other visual stuff. So I kind of, I, I put any sort of personal projects that I was working on or any, um, musical projects that needed to be finished up kind of on ice for a little while while I did that. So like I would just kind of come in, hammer through orders all day, do customer service stuff with Rich and the guys here. And then, um, and then just, you know, continue on and hopefully I would have some time to work on stuff. So a lot of projects like art projects, design projects just kind of took a back seat for a few months. So I'm kind of, I'm not getting caught up per se, but you know, I started the rolls, the, the wheels turning with some of that stuff. Um, like one of those things was like the, um, the Umbra record that we released uh, earlier this year in May. That was a, a record that I recorded in December into January. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so like I, I recorded another record uh, for another project that we kind of put on ice for a, a matter of months. And that's what I'm trying to finish up now. Um, that's going to, uh, surface this fall so as there's like a there's a ton of stuff um that got got pushed to the side 
But to answer your question in a not long-winded way, <laughs> um, I, I do visual work every day, but I'm not doing like really in-depth visual work every day. Yeah. Um, I mean, so like I'm, you know, like between a band, multiple, art, multiple projects, a label that's been a label, a consistent label in our community for so long, and uh, also doing your personal stuff. I can't imagine how you juggle all this shit, dude. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's just a lot of it's a lot of multitasking. You know, when when I get in the office in the morning, when I get to Death Wish, it's like, okay, let's you know, get through emails and then start chopping at these little little lists that I've made of of things of priority. You know, yeah. And I just try to hammer through stuff as 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 efficiently as I can. Yeah. Um, and I, then and then in the middle of that, I'll be like, hey, you have some. Um, um, oh, sorry. See, I'm multitasking right now. I, I do it all day. I got, I got a, a, a show. I got to do it in about, you know, 30 minutes. Yeah. And yeah you got to show you, you exactly. So like, you, you know how it is. It's just like, you, you're just every day you wake up and, and I like that challenge. You know, I'd rather have too much to do and, um, and look at every day as like a really interesting, fun challenge than, um, you know, really be looking for yeah. something to occupy my time. Yeah. It, it's it's cool to it's cool to see that side of you because it's you know I I you know between a band a business and also you know what I do in my personal life I do a lot of production I do I work for many artists and I'm just mm -hmm. like <laughs> sometimes I'm kind of like overwhelmed in the sense that like this phone's going off this email's going off uh, you know my girlfriend's calling and this and that and uh, sometimes I, I become very short with the people around me and it's uh, and uh, it, it, it becomes very difficult to juggle all that, but also for me, it's, I enjoy the aspect of like, okay, staying busy and being busy because it keeps mm -hmm. me on straight personally, you know? hundred um, percent. Keep, it keeps you focused in, in a healthy way. And like, I, I am similar in the sense that I'm, I'm short. I don't mean to be short with people in a, um, in a way where I'm, uh, it's not meant as a negative. It's just that yeah. I'm just trying to be as efficient, as efficient as possible, you know? So like, um, and you have to understand that or you just get, you just get frustrated, you know, like you have to kind of put it in context of like, you know, who you're speaking with and who they're juggling, you know, what the, the things that they're juggling every day. Like I never, um, I, I never assume that somebody has nothing going on in their lives, you know, um, when, when terms, when I'm, when I'm communicating with them, cause we, we all have a ton of things. So I just, I assume that we're all stretched to the limit at all times and that's just the way things are. And that's, that's okay. Yeah, I definitely understand it. And again, you know, thank you for doing this interview because <clears throat> I definitely, <laughs> it sounds like you have a lot going on. Um, obviously, you know, COVID-19 19 has, like, put a halt to the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond Death Wish and your, and your business and your personal life, obviously music has become your career for the most part. Um, how has this affected your life, both personally and the band? Is it, you know, did you guys have tours planned? And what, you sure. know? Sure. Yeah, well, it... It, it's a good question. I actually haven't been asked it that much. So the band had a variety of things planned for the year. The first, the only things that were actually announced that, um, that really affected us was like a, a like a short South American run of a couple of shows. Mm -hmm. uh, was sick of it all. And those shows were postponed and, you know, we'll, we'll at some point be rescheduled. Uh, but we had, uh, we had a, a variety of other tours and festivals all throughout the year for Converge that were planned. Like for our band, we typically plan about six months to a year out when mm -hmm. it comes to touring and stuff. So we kind of know our schedule because we, we all have, you know, things to do and, and, you know, places to be in terms of, uh, you know, other aspects of our lives. So we kind of, we have to operate that way. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, so pretty much that whole, the whole year got, got scrubbed. Um, we had, uh, we had some stuff that we, we still stayed productive in it. You know, we still had some uh, recording plans that, that we're still working on in a variety of ways um, that just got, uh, they didn't get quite derailed. We just had to shift gears a bit and do things in different ways uh, remotely that we otherwise wouldn't be doing. Yeah. Um, 
so it slowed us down there. Um, but you know, we, we still, we're still managed to be productive and do things. Um, I was fortunate to be able to record two albums before everything kind of, you know, hit the fan yeah. in February and March. So, you know, I had the Umber record done and I had another project, um, that we're going to officially announce in a couple of weeks that, um, that I, that was pretty much finished. At least the audio portion was a hundred percent finished. And I was out of the studio and I had, you know, I had a grip of songs done. So, you know, so at least I was fortunate to be, be, uh, be complete semi semi finished with those things um where wounds my my uh band with uh some friends that's more of like a big atmospheric rock band uh we had a few things planned for the year uh, that we had to also postpone as well and uh but you know you you gotta you gotta zig when the world zags you yeah. know you can't just put everything 100 percent on ice you just have to figure things out and you know move forward and that's what we've all been trying to do with all this stuff there's just so many moving parts in what we call the converged universe that uh, that it makes it kind of tricky to get all the planets realigned with something like this. So like, for example, if all, all of our bands that are all related, so it's like, that's Converge, Cave In, Old Man Gloom, mm-hmm. um, you know, Weary Wounds, Umber Vade, uh, Blood From The Soul, um, any other projects, Kurt's Recording Projects, Mutoid Man, Killer Be Killed, um, and I'm probably forgetting some stuff in there. Doom Riders, um, all of these related bands. I, we have to sort of loosely, uh, I don't, I'm going to say manage what everybody is doing because we don't control what everybody is doing, but we have to sort of work with all these bands and their schedules. And now they're rescheduling everything. So like some bands are just, pushing all of their touring from 2020 to 2021 in the exact same place while there was other plans of you know other some of those other bands that are now going to land on top of those things so how do we make those things work you know there's it's already it's already difficult when we start talking about these um these related bands when we're all all firing on all cylinders and can move some stuff around and now there's this big what if all the time hanging over, like if we're even going to have venues open at some point yeah. to, to be able to, you know, safely do this sort of stuff again. Yeah. So like right now we're just trying to stay focused and uh, stay creative, you know, recording stuff. And um, every time we get asked to reschedule something, we just say, yeah, cool. And then yeah. two months later it's moved again. And they say, yeah. yeah, cool. Okay. Let's do that. I feel bad for booking did, agents right now. Like all my oh. booking agents, they're just like pulling their ha- hair out right now because it's like scheduling on top of scheduling on top of you know. Yeah, you know, in in some <laughs> ways, um, pe- people would joke for a long time that like you know booking agents had like the easiest job in the world because they would just say, especially if they had bands that people wanted to see or tours they were representing tours that wanted to you know that people wanted to go check out. They would say, "Hey, do you want to do the show?" And you go, "Yeah, of course." And you just do it, and it just happens. No, it's you know, it's like a, a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and then and then like a logistical nightmare like this occurs. You know, where they're they're used to putting out small fires all of the time, which is already a job in itself. Now it's like the world's on fire, and they're just kind of sitting back and going, "I just have to wait till it burns out, and then they can start you know booking again." Well, it it's it, you know it sounds for the most part during this this time that you were staying productive and busy. You know, um, some people are, are doing that, and then there's a lot mm-hmm. of people in the music industry that are are in a very dark place because there sure. seems to be no end in sight. Is there anything you recommend to your peers and bands and friends that you know? What can they do to to stay, you know, in in a, in a positive headspace? You know, sure. Well, you know. The only advice I can give is just move forward, you know, always move forward and always help other artists and just, you know, put your best foot forward all the time. You know, so like if you if you're looking for something to do and you're you're a musical artist, um, go, you know, home record something. Get together, have a public conversation with people about something, Um, put together some sort of music in some way that keeps you just just keeps you out there. But not not so much for the visibility but just for yourself you know so you feel like you're doing something productive you know all those those you know little songwriting ideas that you've put on the back burner finally do them you know i i got word from a a friend the other day that like in the first like three months of this thing he wrote like 18 songs you know and he's smashing through an album right now and you're just like wow this is crazy you know because you're gonna see and you're gonna see the 
all of the effects of, of this downtime for a lot of people where in, you know, in 2021, they're just going to be like, Hey, surprise, here's two albums. It's yeah. going to be a really strange time because there's going to be, uh, a, yeah, I actually think there's going to be a bit of a bottleneck um, for a variety of things, but I think there's going to be uh, this huge wave of releases that are going to come out at, at the very least digitally. Um, and we're actually already seeing it now with, um, with physical, um, uh, physical manufacturing of records where uh, places are starting to get behind now because they're all open and now everyone's trying to press stuff again. Yeah. And so delays are starting to happen. I think you're going to see that into 2021. And I think you're going to see, you're especially going to see that in the live front when all of every band that didn't happen to survive all of this, that, you know, wants to go out and reschedule these tours. Um, they're going to, you know, they're going to be in a waiting line. There's going to be a, like a queue for yeah. all of these spots to open up, you know? So like, I think every tour that said they're going to be postponed until 2021, that hasn't, you know, continuously announced dates, they're going to be out of luck when they look for venues in four months, you know, there's going to be nothing available. Yeah. It's, it's funny you say that. Cause I, I fully admit it, admit that that is going to be a problem. And, you know, watching, watching from my perspective, you know, not only do I play in a band, but I also work for venues. I work for production companies mm -hmm. and watching these independent venues in the next six months, we're going to see a flow of a bunch of venues closing down. And that's very important. Yeah. And when it, when it does come back to touring, it's going to be like, it's going to be few and far between where to play. And it's going to be, it's, it's going to be weird for, you know, it's going to be a really weird, weird for the next couple of years. If I was to, if I was to predict it, it's going to be the, the big dogs are going to survive because they have fat that they can trim in terms of venues and production companies and the very small uh, DIY, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to do what I want. People are going to survive because they do what they want yeah. and they're going to find places for people to play. Um, it's going to be the small to mediums, which is actually where most of the punk and hardcore world exist, are going to take the biggest hit because we're used to having some sort of formalities and some sort of um, structure there. Yeah. But we uh, we don't have, you know, the these we're not live nation, you know, and we're not, you know, monster companies that have, you know, billions of dollars to be able to sort of insulate themselves from the effects of a lot of these things. And that's where you're going to see it, you know, hit the most. I also predict that you're going to see a variety of bands become totally inactive or at the very least when they do come back, be at a very limited capacity where you're going to see people that essentially had to change their job trajectories. You know, if you were, if you were like a, um, if you were like a, a young band that was a moderately sized band that you were making, you know, like a lower middle class wage of being an artist by full time touring, now that dried up for a year and you may have quit all your, your jo jobs at home to be able to do that. What you come back to in terms of an employment pool is going to be so small, you might have to take full time jobs that you wouldn't otherwise take just to be employed to keep a roof over your head, which is in turn is going to take you out of being an artist period. Cause you're not going to have enough time to be yeah. an artist anymore. I mean, um, and I think there's gonna be a lot of casualties with that. I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing now in the sense that like, I'm thinking plan B, you know, like if live music can't come back, you know, my, my mm -hmm. whole life and career has been on music. So now I'm like, yep. you know, what, what can I do next? If this doesn't come back within and me, for me, it's like, fuck, if this doesn't come back by December, I need to start. Yeah thinking plan B in another career. And, uh, and it's a, it's a very sad and scary feeling. Um, but again, you know, for me personally, that's the reason why I started doing these streams is just, you know, I'm not, I'm not really good. I've never thought of ever interviewing, interviewing somebody or talking to people. Sure. It's something outside of my comfort level that I was like, you know, what? I want, I want to stay connected with, with, you know, people within my community and, and just, you know, shine a light on like, you know, on, on the, you know, music, that's not necessarily mainstream music, but, you know, for the most part, yeah. on music and, I, and it's, it's keeping my head straight and it, it's cool to be able to create something different. Cause for me as, as, as a band member, I can't write a riff. I can't write music, you know, but I do know how to produce things. I do know how to set a stage up. And right. It, and it, and totally. it's, it's really cool to, to be able to do that with my outlet. Um, but, but again, you know, Jake, you know, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm glad, you know, you're, you're staying productive. I, I, I can't wait to see Converge again. Before I let yeah, you hopefully we'll be able to 
play at some point. Well, we'll see. Something will happen. You know, de- dude, definitely. If not, if not, you know, I have to ask, you know, because you know, a lot of people are, are, are you know, their, their feelings towards it are very different. Would Converge ever do a live stream set? We can't because we're spread out too far. So th- three of us are within like a half hour of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ben Ben lives in Los Angeles now. Oh, shit. So, yeah. So, um, you know, he's coming out here to do some work with us soon. Um, but even with the logistics, uh, we're going to be busy that entire time when he's out here already. But even if we could, the logistics of that would be quite hard to, you know, to, to do and do well. You know, I talked to um, my pal John Baisley a, a bit uh, via text leading up to their uh, their recent stream, uh, that Baroness stream that they did. And I talked to him after it as well to kind of get feedback and how he felt about the whole process and stuff. And, you know, it's it's very uh, it's very alien to, to everybody to do that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if I personally would want to do that. I think that if you want that for our band, you can watch YouTube, you know, yeah. you can watch shows, you know, do you really want to see us just like all in a room at God city practicing and like making some noise together? I don't know if that would like, I don't know. I don't know if it would, it would work and be, it, it wouldn't work. I don't think it would work for us. Like Her, I would think for our band, it would have a level of corniness to it where other bands can turn it more into an art experience. That's different yeah. for us. I just, I don't know. It's, our shows are very much about like the sort of physicality of the show. You know, we're not, you know, we're, we're, we're not terror, you know? So like, it's not like, you know, like high fives and stage vibe and, and, and stage dives the whole time. It's not like totally nuts, but it is a very physical experience. Yeah. And I think, I, I don't think I'd want to do it without it with just a camera in the room. I just would, yeah. you know, it would just, it would feel odd to me. It's, it's weird. It's weird because, you know, personally, you know, when this first started, I was like, dude, I don't want, I, I don't, I, to me, watching a band, the reason why I go to shows is to experience that live aspect of it. Um, yeah. and that, now the wheels have turned in the sense that, like, I'm so desperate to see music that I'll Totally. Take I can see that. In any format possible. But me as being, you know, a, you know, a producer and someone that makes, you know, events, I'm like, okay, I'm thinking of ways to make it and do it creatively. Um, yeah, and, and it can be done. I mean, you know, Behemoth did one. Uh, Code Orange did one early on with their record release show because they basically, they I think they paid for like they had to have paid for full production already, and they had to have a show because they they were all in, and so they you know chose to, you know, and I think that was that was a really smart move, and that's what I would have done if I was in that situation because it'd be like shit. What am I going to do? Like they were right in the crosshairs of everything getting shut down. You might as well do something with it and be early to the game. Um, I saw people um, chatter that the behemoth one was really cool, that it was essentially like a theatrical event that they just recently did. Um, Yeah, you could do stuff like that for sure, but we're not really a theatrical band. Yeah. You know, like that, that works for certain kinds of bands with like with pyro and lights and like a a show, you know, we're pretty much as stripped down as, as you're going to get when it comes to that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, so like I just don't, um, I don't see it working well for what we offer. I mean, could we tailor something? Yeah, for sure. We could, but I don't, I don't know. I I would rather concentrate our efforts on some other stuff that we have going on uh, right now as a band than, than that. But you yeah, know, who knows? Maybe we'll get bored in a few months and say, okay, cool. We'll do it. I mean, and, and, you know, in my opinion, I, I envision like, you know, with your artwork creatively, like, doing something and tying it in with your guys' music, I think it'd be fucking awesome, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, it'd be cool. It'd be really cool, but then it's just like, I don't know. It could be a lot of hiccups there too, you know. I don't know. I, I could just also see it, yeah, seeing it get very Portlandia, you know, and just like shit going totally south and being like Spinal Tap, you know. Like, and do, <laughs> do, do any of us really want that? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, well, you know, hats off to the bands that are doing it. And, you know, are figuring out ways to stay creative and, uh, you know, stay productive. It's, it's good for them. So. Yeah. We, uh, we created one for a touche and, uh, and touche created a full album visual that ties in with the, with the, with the stream and it, it's, mm-hmm. you gotta watch it. It's, it's going to be fucking cool. Yeah. 
it's going to be really cool. I'm, and I'm excited to, to see, see what, how it turns out. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, man, any, any shout outs, uh, to, to the world, I mean, to people. I mean, just, uh, you know, shout out to all, all, all our, our peers and acquaintances that are out there. There's, you know, there's too many of them to name, but there's a, there's a shit ton of bands going through a lot of stuff and a shit ton of people going through a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a very uh, trying time in a variety of ways. And I don't know, let's uh, be empathetic and compassionate and be good people through it all. Definitely. Well, I mean, I hope you have a great day again. Thank you for doing this, man. And, uh, all right, man. Hopefully you cross paths soon and play a show soon. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get back out there. <laughs> all right. Take care, brother. All right. Be good. Bye. Peace.